Yes. I think we've got a good group of people. Probably more will join us as we go on. Um, and so thank you all for uh, joining us today. Our guest speaker is Martha Schwartz, and I have put her um, biography and some of her um, information in the chat, so I'm not going to repeat it here, but just to say she's a distinguished um, landscape architect with um, vast international experience, uh, and also that um, she's very interested in geoengineering and expanding the conversation on the range of solutions that the world should be pursuing in climate change. She's recently returned from a trip to um, Africa and engaging with um, Global South communities on these topics. And so we're going to learn from her today more about her experience and her observations, as well as um, engage in a conversation about how we at HPAC can more effectively engage with the Global South. So um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Martha and have her add anything she she would like. I think people would be very interested in the nonprofit that you just um, mentioned, Martha. Um, we hopefully are going to be joined by Stephen Salter, who's um, very um, engaged in the research on um, cloud brightening and uh, other geo geoengineering mechanisms. So, Martha, I'm turning it over to you and um, welcome. Well, thank you very much. And um, Suzanne, I am basically going to be focusing on the urban landscape. And I'm doing this because I'm a landscape architect. And this is a real issue that I feel now is coming up where we are really neglecting what we're going to be doing for cities because, well, because, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about that. But just to kind of let you know my own um, kind of feedback about the, the time. It was a month and I actually lectured at around 12 different universities in Rwanda, Kenya, and South Africa. Now, what was interesting is that there was one university that really had somebody who really knew about this. I mean, I didn't really get any feedback from uh, any university in, in, except for with water strand. And um, there, there was a, a professor there who really knew what was going on. And we have actually talked about actually having these kinds of lectures with him because he's somebody who could actually do that. Um, the reason that I'm doing this also is because I found out, I also was doing lectures about the urban landscape. Um, again, they have one or two areas in, within their universities that basically in South Africa that had any landscape architecture programs. And given the fact that they are now facing adaptation because now we're gonna to start to be sending our money finally to Africa as per the COP27, who are going, who are going to actually do that if there's nobody who knows how to deal with na nature and knows how, how to build with that? When they're, you know, when when they're going to adapt, the architects don't know anything about it. The planners don't know anything about it, and yet they're going to adapt. How is that even going to work? So that has actually created a real question for me. I've gone to Harvard, uh, our our new climate guru, and said, look, why can't Harvard actually, you know, help to actually do an online course that would get to Africa? And I have somebody who can connect, who can actually get that out to all of Africa. So this is just at the beginning, but these are the things I'm thinking about. And um, I really wasn't able to get a lot of feedback about SAI because it was such a strange idea about what we were doing and where that came from, what the background was. But I do think that there were a lot of people who would be very interested in knowing that there was actually some way where we'll be able to tap, tap down the heat. So I think there would be people there who might be interested. I thought, well, you know, we need your voices to actually come to the United States. So trying to gather the names of people who actually are interested in this and where we can actually have some kind of, you know, 
people who are interested to say that we of the Global South are interested in this because every time I talk to somebody during uh, some kind of uh, these debates, they say, well, the people in the Global South don't want this to happen. I'm like, I don't think so. I don't believe you. And that's why I went there. Okay, so I'm going to go for it because I know that we don't have a lot of time. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just go through about of uh, the landscape and why this is a, such an important issue and not just for the global south, it's for us. So um, I'm going to start with this. And um, I do have a nonprofit and the, those red things is a leaflet that I brought to Africa when I went. And I went as, as uh, I was invited to go to the first U.S. African Frontiers of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Symposium. So I was able to do that. Um, I thought maybe engineering, maybe we'll get some geoengineering, but there wasn't. But what I did do is I sat down and I passed out these leaflets and started talking to the other scientists. And a lot of them went out. So the guy who I'm kind of sitting on top or grabbing is somebody who would actually be the person who we would be able to communicate with. So just having other people who we can, I can actually have um, a relationship to is something that I could take forward. So I think that could be something that might be useful to you guys. And so who is that funny. fellow, Martha? Who was, was the fellow, who was the fellow that you're hugging there? Oh, he's cute. His, I know his name is George, but I don't have his last name. I, I don't okay. have his last name. But yeah, he was very, very nice. So I, you know, I'm trying to actually go back. I've, um, I know uh, a number of people in, you know, under uh, David's group, Joshua Horton, and he's going over to Africa also. I don't know whether you're in touch with him, but he's going over to actually try to, and I'm not sure exactly. Oh, it's it's one of the groups that he put together. And he asked me if I knew people in Africa who would be able to come over and testify that they think this is, you know, it's something they want to actually know more about. So I could actually put that together for you guys as well. So um, shall I start here, Suzanne? Is that okay? All right. So why are cities so important in addressing climate change? And this one article says that ending climate change begins with the cities. And cities are key to combating climate change due to their size and ability to change. The issues focuses on emissions. However, as I've only, you know, on my leaflet, climate change cannot be solved by emissions cuts alone. We all know that. There are many articles about smart cities, smart cars, smart, et cetera that address cities and climate change, but the urban landscape has very little written about it, how to protect our cities. And this is a terrible oversight, most likely due to a lack of understanding the science of climate change, and that the landscape is viewed as a commodity and an opportunity to decorate buildings. However, we've run out of time and we to avoid climate change catastrophe, because even if we stop emissions, it's highly likely the heat will continue to rise. So this must be brought into how we plan and design our cities. And this will mean that the land the city sits on will become more valuable than ever, but only if we can let it work as part of nature. And cities will be going through extreme, extreme changes as they will be heavily impacted by climate change. So 70% of the world's population live in cities, you probably know that, and the world's population is projected to reach 9.8 billion by 2050. And the report estimates that by 2030, the world could have gone from 31 to 43 megacities. So Bill Gates has calculated that the world will have to build the equivalent of one New York City a month until 2060 in order to create enough housing for the expanding global population. That's a lot of housing we have to build. And cities are key contributors to climate change as urban activities are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions and they consume two thirds of the world's energy creating, as I said, 70% of the global carbon dioxide emissions. And the heat they generate are like smokestacks, putting even more heat up into the atmosphere. Climate impacts have costly impacts on cities' basic services, infrastructures, housing, human livelihoods, and health, mostly caused by the rising heat. And it's true that the redesign of cities would have the biggest and positive ability 
to combat climate change through taking down carbon dioxide. However, that is totally dependent on bringing down emissions. So as the planet continues to heat up, what can cities do to protect themselves? And buildings with trees on the roofs alone won't be able to cool a city. Cities are an integral part of the solutions, but in order to save our cities, we have to integrate performative landscapes to provide livable environments for people. And while climate change has different impacts across the globe, cities share a lot of the same issues. They suffer heat island effect, and the heat island effect is the most dangerous and deadly of all the climate effects Extreme heat is far more lethal than hurricanes or tornadoes or earth, earthquakes, or even all of them combined in any year in the United States. And lethal heat is somewhat the new normal in many of the global South countries. Urban heat island effect is familiar to about 80% of the world's population now. And the world's coastal cities are being warned to prepare for the possible two meter sea level rise by 2050 and a possibility of six meters by the end of the century. New York is very vulnerable to flooding due to more precipitation happening in northeastern United States, where I am right now, and the amount of impervious surfaces making it impossible for stormwater to be absorbed by the soil, causing the subway to flood. In, in 2021, there were 11 deaths by people drowning in their basement level apartments, and that will happen again and again. And here are 10 cities in the world that are currently facing freshwater supply issues. Conversely, drought will also be an issue for cities as the climate is unstable and cities can suffer from both too much or not enough rain. And a growing list of cities in the world are facing serious challenges in providing adequate fresh water to their residents. And the United Nations predicts that by 2025, two thirds of the world's population may be living under water stressed conditions. Heat will affect insecurity, high food prices, income losses, lost livelihood opportunities, and adverse heat impacts, and population displacements. And with nearly 195 million undernourished people, India shares a quarter of the global hunger burden. Globally, agriculture will be highly affected due to the irregularity of the climate, but it is particularly acute in the Northeast United States, hey, where heavy rainfall events have increased more than in any other region of the country, meaning that at some point, New York will need to be more self-sufficient in its food production, as many will many cities around the world. And countries are now starting to hoard food. By 2050, countries will have to provide food for their own people as agriculture will likely diminish as global arable lands diminish. And the climate reduces agricultural output. The bottom line is that cities, states, countries will have to be able to become more and more self-sufficient. And the failure of urban infrastructure is a very common problem in cities. Over 1,000 miles of New York City water mains are more than 100 years old, leading to frequent and disruptive breaks. And service infrastructure in New York is increasing the risk of disruption, leading to cascading failures during, during extreme weather and climate-related disruptions. As infrastructure crumbles and fails, we need to be less dependent on centralized systems. And New York is not able to actually do this because of the amount of money. And this is going to be a real problem throughout the world. However, as I said, they can't afford to rebuild anything. But the good news is that New York's infrastructure badly needs to be rebuilt, which gives us a chance to update urban infrastructures to integrate natural systems which are less expensive and more sustainable. Urban dwellers are particularly vulnerable, partly because many of these infrastructure systems are reliant on each other. And as climate change impacts increase, climate-related events will have a large consequence for significant numbers of people living in cities. And we'll need to build more flexible, smaller-scale micro-infrastructure systems that can be more easily accessed, fixed, and replaced. Research is now investigating cutting edge urban infrastructure approaches evolving around micro scale solutions to water, energy, and waste. And climate change impacts create major displacements all over the world. People are flocking to Dhaka and Bangladesh to find refuge. And in the last 17 years alone, the number of people living in slums in Bangladesh cities has risen to 60%, with up to 2,000 people moving to the city every day. As a result of the Himalayan glacier melt, there could be 2 billion climate refugees in Southeast Asia by 2100. So let's dive into how the urban landscape can protect our cities as the climate heats up. 
The urban landscape can be planned and designed at all scales. In order for cities to adapt and respond to climate change impacts, we will need to start with how we can rearrange and restructure our cities in order to make them more manageable, more sustainable, and more self-sufficient. Respatializing will allow us to be less dependent on centralized infrastructure, we'll be walking distances to most life needs, we'll establish neighborhoods that can work together to address localized issues, communities can generate and share resources such as food, localized energy, and enable self-sufficiency. And this reorganization makes for a much more resilient city. The concept of community has been awakening as a renewed way of looking at our cities and new ways of living. And there's a strong movement such as the 15 or 20 minute city by cities around the world, such as Paris, Barcelona, and Portland, Oregon, where this started to rethink and reimagine a different way of life that can be sustainable, healthier, fair, and can take humanity into the future. Cities must regroup neighborhoods to work together to address localized issues. And this will be needed for quicker reaction to unexpected problems that may come up during climate change as issues and will get worked out more quickly and efficiently in smaller groups. At an individual neighborhood, borough and city scale, we have to work to generate food at all scales and can collectively build and use renewable energy. We have to become more self-sufficient and when the lights go out and communications are down or supply chains are broken and you're hungry, make sure that you have what you need. And the more we can provide for ourselves, the more secure we will be. Changing the city through getting single ownership cars out of the city and creating more energy efficient public transit is actually the first step to creating a sustainable and healthy city and to prepare our cities for climate change. The report suggests that fewer cars will travel more miles by 2030 because ride shares may never need to park. When they would drop off passengers, they would keep going to pick up new passengers, which would open up vast tracts of land for new uses, like wider sidewalks, more housing, parks, and perhaps even forests. Some cities are already preparing for this future. Future transport is the next step to allowing our ability to reorganize our cities. And the beginning of the end of single ownership of cars is growing. And changing the city through the redesign of our cities can create valuable space for even more valuable uses. There are numbers of very forward cities which are already thinking about ditching their cars and depending on public transit. So we can imagine that by 2060, we'll have change to electric automated vehicles, Mostly importantly, with the oncoming of automatic vehicles, it will give us the opportunity to harvest and repurpose our streets for better and more healthy issues. So you can see this drawing of our present car and AVs and due to the smaller areas AVs will have, we will be able to harvest 35 to 50% of the city's rights of way, enabling cities to plant at least one lane throughout the city called the linear urban forest. And I'm currently working on a Harvard Climate Change Solutions Grant based on a studio I taught at the GSD in 2017. And the studio was about how can we save Boston by afforesting the city? And it was set up in the future of 2060. Students afforested all trees, sorry, all streets in four Boston townships that had 108 square miles and a population of 890 people. And each student designed every street typology. And here you see one student's work on one of her street typologies. It's a neighborhood with a one-way street. How could this be reorganized to include a linear forest? So here's a plan showing the insertion of the linear forest, which basically are two rows on either side of the street. And the idea was to create a central lane that wound through the forest and have a plaza-like environment. And the sections show underground stormwater devices that detain and retain water, which would be used in the times of drought. And this image from another student shows a bit more about how these trees and forests could be variable according to the needs of the city. Now at the end, all the students created metrics in terms of the benefits of the forests, which were many. The two most impressive ones are first that there was no stormwater that went into the combined sewer in Boston, which often overflows now. And secondly, we saved $207 million in energy savings because they didn't have to put on the air conditioning. 
And this impressive outcome was what got me the Harvard grant, which is actually very rare. And hopefully when I get this done, there'll be a book about the urban linear forest. So let's dive into how urban land can protect our cities as, a, as the climate goes up and up. And this is the planning agenda for the urban landscape. We'll plan and design for efficient land use policy, build for proximity, renewable energy and efficiency. We'll have efficient future public transport. There'll be flexibility and increased area of urban landscapes. We'll cool down the city. We'll have access to food and water and we'll be able to be more self-sufficient using circular economies. So as climate change impacts increase, climate-related events will have large consequences for significant numbers of people in, living in cities. The urban land will be a necessary part of making cities livable in the future. And this image, collage, landscapes, are usually not in cities such as agriculture, forestry, and natural landscapes that will be needed to be integrated into cities in the future. However, we should start building them now. So why the urban landscape is a necessity? When we think of climate change disruption to, to terrestrial life, we tend to think of big things, forests, polar bears, whole categories of birds, but it's the microscopic soil organisms that form the foundation for almost all land-based life. Not only do they provide plants with nutrient processing and water transport services, they also regulate a large portion of the carbon cycle, including capture and re-release of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Well, first of all, without healthy soils, it's game over for almost all land, plants, and animals, including us. Landscape solutions, starting with the rebuilding of soils, will be crucial for the future of cities. Now, due to the fact that the majority of people will be living in cities, those of us who are professionals within the built environment have a lot to think about how cities will have to change to tackle the immense issues that are right in front of us. However, the subject of the urban landscape as a vital player does not exist, except for our new recognition since COVID, that green areas are needed spaces, spaces for leisure and recreation. While it can provide so much more, the urban land is an invisible landscape. First of all, we can no longer dismiss the landscape as a commodity where the value of it depends on what gets built on it, nor can it be seen as what landscape architects call parsley around the pig, just as a decoration. The urban landscape will be the platform for our lives in the future. It is therefore a necessity that this profession comes out of the closet. First, the public realm landscape is the largest piece of urban infrastructure a city has that can be re-envisioned, re-engineered, and redesigned, regenerated to make a city climate ready for the future. And beyond mitigation and food security, the urban landscape can provide food security, water security, reduce urban heat island, mitigating flooding, reduce air pollution, support human physical and mental health, and create beauty and economic value. So adaptation is the wheelhouse of landscape architecture. Mitigation is important for our future, but reduction of vulnerability needs to be addressed now. Adaptation can be integrated into many aspects of fighting climate change, such as planning and design, physical insertions, such as coastal defenses, green infrastructure to deal with stormwater and flooding, and restoring wetlands to protect coastal cities. We can create non-structural methods, such as early warning systems, and in governance, we work with policymaking and polices and policies within partnerships. As builders of the urban environment, architects, landscape architects, planners, and scientists and engineers must be working together. And sustainability means that by reducing vulnerability of climate change, cities can maintain stability in the future. And many nations and communities are already taking steps to build resilient societies and economies. But considerably greater action and ambition will be needed to manage risks both now and the future. So again, this is something that has really um, made me very concerned about Africa. While they may be getting money to be able to adapt, there are not the people there who would be able to actually um, make that happen. So while adaptation is seen as a way for the Global South countries to protect themselves, also, we too must invest in adaptation to save our cities. It is hubristic to think that technology and smart cities and smart cars and smart houses and smart buildings and smart this and that alone will be able to protect our cities and citizens from catastrophe caused by global warming. 
And without integrating the land and regenerating natural processes within cities, we simply will not be able to create livable cities. The United Nations supports a coordinated global effort on nature-based solutions and sustainable infrastructure to provide sustainable solutions to the unfolding climate crisis. And the European Commission has defined nature-based solutions as solutions that are inspired by, supported by, or copied from nature to form a comprehensive agenda while looking at the city holistically and having vast potential for energy and resource efficiency. Nature-based solutions are a key part of climate action and biodiversity conservation that improve socio-ecological issues, health benefits, and co-benefits for the economy. Green infrastructures are nature-based uh, solutions. So green infrastructure is defined as an interconnected network of open green spaces that provide a range of ecosystem services, thus creating healthier environments through landscape projects. Green infrastructures in cities contribute significantly to carbon sequestration, retention of particulate matter, mitigation of heat island, and reduction of surface runoff, directly favoring the health and well being of the population. Gray infrastructure refers to technical and engineering solutions used as infrastructure, such as dams, seawalls, roads, pipes, or water treatment plants. And the issue with gray infrastructure is twofold. It is reliant on the use of often unrecyclable and finite resources. It uses a tremendous amount of unrenewable re uh, resources and energy, and it is often temporary. As climate risks increase and intensify, gray solutions will need to be repaired and eventually replaced. Green infrastructure gives back by providing our communities with essential environmental benefits. However, it also works in a hybrid structure where a living system has been constructed along with technical and material components introduced to make the system work within a city. Here you see a sort of hybrid green and gray infrastructure which can improve resilience to climate impacts while also, also resulting in environmental, economic, and social and co-benefits. So the benefits of green infrastructure are the ability to adapt, less heat stress, more biodiversity, food production, better air quality, climate equity, resiliency, sustainable energy, clean water, health, psychological health, storm water. So you've really heard this and I'll be doing it over and over again, but just quickly. So there are many types of green infrastructures. Smaller implementation of green infrastructure can be very inventive. This is somewhere in Europe, I think it's Germany, which is always miles ahead of everyone. By removing impervious surfaces and planting with ground cover and although simple, provides so many benefits in such a simple ways. Besides cooling the air and allowing the water to percolate back in the soil, it also beautifies the city, creating a very important benefit to humans, which is increasing the quality of life. Streets around the world are being redesigned to mimic natural streams, which flow to storm drains to avoid flooding houses. We are slowly taking nature's way of working on board. Even opening up small underutilized areas in cities and planting them with something that will transform cities. And first, it helps hugely in dealing with stormwater management. Soils and plants will cool the city and help with air pollution. And you don't have to be picky about where you plant plants. Find little bits and pieces in cities and put some seeds into it. And after a while, the city becomes green. And by replacing underutilized spaces in the city and planting them with ground covers, we can absorb more stormwater, we can stop flooding. We can protect topsoil, which is very important. Otherwise, trees start falling down and burning. Stop soil erosion, the same thing, and reduces risks of fires, cools the cities, and stops subsidence, and saves money in the long run in terms of maintenance and reducing the damages caused by floods. So basically, the idea is to green everything you can possibly think of. So more and more cities are realizing the importance of greening their cities and the importance of maintaining existing green areas and urban centers to promote the balance of the ecosystem. This is a, a project that we actually did in China. And let's see. So the integration of green infrastructure means that we must now focus on greening our whole city. This isn't really a choice. It's what will, will be needed to survive the future. And no amount of gray infrastructure can do this. Melbourne, Australia regularly tops the world's most livable city list, but Melbourne has also steadily become one of the most eco-friendly cities. Rob Adams, the city's planner, and I think the best planner in the world, has made a major effort to secure the health of Melbourne citizens by planting 70,000 trees into the city. 
His vision has been to green every surface of the city and he's really done a good job. Mel Melbourne has created an initiative to green Melbourne by greening laneways and roofs and walls and building urban forests, all of which are green infrastructure. Now, I would assume all you guys do know about what ecology is, but just in case, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it because it's absolutely fundamental to making green technologies and green infrastructure work. Inserting ecological systems into the city at a scale that matters, meaning a foresting cities at a scale that can impact positively the climate of the city. It's a little about, a little like a mini geoengineering. It is a radical idea that has not yet blossomed. And when we think of urban landscapes, we think of different kinds of parks, pocket parks, streets, playgrounds, walkways around lakes. And these are all areas that perform for human amazement and for amusement, sorry, and fun. And however, inserting ecological systems is an entirely different thing. First, one must understand what ecology is and at landscape architecture, we are steeped in this knowledge before we even pick up a pencil. An ecosystem is defined as a large community of living organisms, plants, animals, and microbes in a particular area. And the living and physical components are linked together through nutrient cycles and energy flows. Ecosystems are of any size, but usually they are in particular places. And linking together through the soil is the critical piece of an ecosystem as the components are highly connected. And if one of the components are lost, the entire ecosystem could fail. Urban afforestation is one of the most important of all green infrastructures. However, in order to allow forests to provide maximum ecological services, forests must be connected through living soils. And street trees give very little value to cities. They make almost no impact except that they look good. Whereas a forest within a city can contribute ecological services that significantly support the quality of life in cities as well as supporting nature. And we've been through this list, but the benefits are relevant to our well being. And the idea of urban A forests is starting to take hold. The only problem we're facing is the lack of imagination. Urban forests will mitigate urban heat island effect, stabilize soils, reduction of air pollution, and all the other things that um, beyond that. And I will even say that these benefits are necessary for humanity to continue. And the list of benefits of urban and forests continue. So, there are so many things that are so important about having these living forests inserted into our cities that I think it should actually be a policy. And there are companies that can create urban forests, whether large or small. Entrepreneur Shubendu Sharma's company, A Forest, creates forests on any patch of land in any area the size of six parking spaces. A 300 tree of forest can come to life for the cost of an iPhone. A forest has worked in these countries, and Shubenda says a forest is on a mission to bring back native forests by creating them and works passionately to create natural, wild, maintenance-free native forests on and off-site to provide the best solutions at the lowest possible cost. And Shubenda is building forests all over the world, and we are now working together on projects in the U.S., in the Middle East, and, and on our uh, Harvard Climate uh, Grant also. And these forests are based on restoring native forests from seeds of native trees in very degraded soils. It's a unique methodology proven to work worldwide, irrespective of the soil and the climatic conditions. This shows the process of growing micro dense forests. His method involves planting two to four trees per square meter. The image to the left shows saplings that have just been planted, which have been grown from seeds gathered from the native forests. And to the right is the forest fast growth in three years and are self-sustaining. They can be built in polluted and industrialized areas to fit any shape and size. The forests he builds are up to 30 times more dense compared to conventional plantations. They're 30 times better at noise and dust reduction. They're up to 30 times better in carbon dioxide absorption as compared to monoculture plantations and are completely maintenance-free wild and native forests after the first three years. They are completely chemical and chemical fertilizer free forests that sustain itself and support local biodiversity. So inserting real forests into cities would be one of the most impactful solutions for cities as they get much hotter and wetter. It's an idea that cities should be considering and starting now. Now the urban landscape is a blind spot and I'm getting to the end, 
in the planning and development process. Certain remarkable, valuable, histor historic, and beautiful landscapes are given sanctuary, but the everyday landscape, the social and economic and physical context of our lives have no champion. Fragmented into various components that are green, gray, or blue, agricultural, historical, ecological landscapes are often undervalued and neglected and seemingly belong to everyone, but actually no one. The role of the urban landscape and the acknowledgement of its accompanied profession of landscape architectures are both crucial missing pieces within the sector of the built environment. The profession of landscape architect is horribly and now dangerously underutilized. And this is largely due to the fact that the profession ranks very low on the hierarchy of modern architecture conceived at the beginning of the 20th century when the Bauhaus leader, Walter Gropius, deemed women not smart enough to be architects because we had smaller brains. So women were allowed women's work such as textiles and weaving. And I would think that gardening would be in that bucket. We are seen as a handmaiden to the architects. And I say this as I've taught at the Graduate School of Design for 30 years and this still exists even within academia. We still don't have a name as landscape architecture and landscape architects are often called landscape designers, landscapers, landscape technicians, and thought of as gardeners, decorators, less essential, underrated, unknown, or misunderstood. And this is really an issue for, is really an issue for the profession, but since we're so nice, uh, nothing much is happening. In other words, nobody within the profession is really doing much. So I've decided I need to do something about it. And our cry is not to bolster up the profession so we get our jobs. It's so we can share our knowledge and experience with planners, architects, clients, engineers, politicians, mayors, or anyone who is involved or interested in cities and the built environment. And I see this profession in a different light as I learn more and more about the tipping points as they move forward towards abrupt change. And, um, oh, sorry, that's New York. So, um, so, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, I, I lost my, my spot here. So, so I see the profession in a different light, as I said. Um, it's critical that this small of professionals are integrated into the mainstream within the built environment sector, since we are the only profession within that sector that designs with living systems. Landscape architects, knowing that the solutions to this urgent problem needs more than a myriad of technical fi te technological fixes, see the bigger picture and providing ideas at scale supported by convincing narratives, we are changing behaviors at an international, no national and local level. We work with Arthur, the bio your, your, your your slide is frozen. I don't know if you really you know. No, this is. Screen. I think this is probably the, maybe the last one. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I, I thought maybe it was. Yeah. But thank you very much. I'm having a problem with taking a look at my notes. <laughs> that was fine, but thank you. So yeah, we we work with the biosphere. We work with soils, airs, water, nature. We work with the relationship people have with their territory that shapes their identity, culture, and values. This ethos underlies our deep respect for the profound value of the land and its capacity to address global environmental challenges. I and many others are concerned that without the acknowledgement and the understanding of how important the regeneration of our lands and the integration of nature within cities is, we may miss this moment to act. As the climate crisis is happening faster than ever predicted. And from my point of view, we will shoot beyond the Paris Agreement goals and while many more people know much more about the science of climate change, we as landscape architecture, we are all out there working to realize adaptation methods and work with green infrastructures, but only if there is an awareness of our profession. And my hope is that more people understand what we do and that the professionals and others who are involved in within the built environment come together in collaboration so we can collectively go forward in a concerted action that is science-based and work together with clear goals. And given the complexities we face, we can accomplish much more by working together. So that's it, folks. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that this, kind of, this is kind of a mishmash in terms of kind of 
bringing two of these things together, kind of my experience in Africa and feeling like, oh my God, what are these people going to do? I mean, nobody is going to be able to tell them how to adapt even once they get the money. And I, you know what I finally told them? I said, well, the architecture schools, I said, okay, look, here's the deal, Lucille. This is how the US works. They're not going to pay you anything if they don't know what they're paying for. So why don't you take your students and whomever you can find who knows about you know, land planning and figure out what are the areas that need to be adapted. And you're going to have to be looking and going out at the landscape to do that. And then you can figure out what it is that needs to be done. You can look up on the web website kind of ideas that you think you would need to be able to address them, figure out how much money you're going to need, put it all together, and send the ticket to Joe Biden. At least you'll have something. They'll say, they may actually give you the money if you can tell them what it is you need to do. But they do not have, they don't have that. So there we go. That's something that I'm really very concerned about. Thank you, That's Martha. My and I'm going to um, I'm going to start with a question and invite everyone else who has any questions or comments to um, raise their hand on the screen, and I'll call on you in order as I get it. Um, but um, the question I wanted to pose is: You presented a dichotomy, and in, in that um, we know that in the global south, adaptation and resilience are significant. Um, and at the same end, there's um, obviously landscape architecture and some of the adaptation methodologies are based in nature. And at the right. same time, we also want to engage them in broadening their appreciation of the need for higher technology um, applications in terms of climate change solutions and climate, and particularly yes. climate cooling. So in your in your conversations with the communities to which you with which you met and to whom you lectured in Africa, what did you what did you what kind of connections did you find you could make between the impacts that they were experiencing, the need for adaptation and resilience, um, as well as a broader appreciation of the kinds of solutions that might help reduce the impacts um, that they're experiencing? Well, I would say, I mean, and I read some, uh, you know, some, uh, some things that were coming in over academia about the fact that there is very little information that is flowing from the global north to the global south countries. There's very little information coming in. And they're wondering why. So I'm like, I mean, that's where I thought, well, why doesn't Harvard just kind of do something about this and you know get this going? And I may be able to do that. And I'm going to be working on that. But there is not a lot of information coming in. I mean, Catherine Nagila, who was, as I said, the head of all the science, the academics, you know, the, the academias within all the countries there had no idea about that. And that's why I went. There were very, very few that had any information about this. I mean, what I when I lectured them, they, they hadn't heard anything like that. They really didn't know a lot, except for there was one school that did. Um, you know, I left, They were, I love the people. I mean, they were wonderful. They were so lovely, really great, enthusiastic. They asked questions, but I left with like, oh my God, I had, I mean, I started crying when I started to land in LaGuardia, New York, I started crying. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm so lucky to live here, even if it's a really, I mean, a crazy shitty city, but I was just really like, there was some order. And Africa is so different than we are, so different in terms of how we, um, I mean, how we uh, govern ourselves. I mean, we actually do govern ourselves, but it's really, 
they, they really are not they're not they're not really good at being able to govern the countries they are still fighting with each other in terms of you know the different tribes I mean, when I went to Rwanda, there were guard, ar army guards all like, walking up and down the street because there's still wars going on. And there's so much corruption that is going on. I was, I was shocked to see that apartheid was still running, running high. It was, it was, I mean, truly a real- so it Penetrating the chaos, and then, uh, but did you get a sense that there was receptivity to? There was, yes, Suzanne. There was. There was a lot of receptivity. I mean, they were, you know, they want every school asked me to kind of, you know, put up a, a, a program about landscape architecture. Um, there were a lot of questions about SAI, and you know, is that really going to happen, or this, that, and the other. And a lot of people, I, I told them on my website, I said, look, you know, I would like to be able to, you know, have you have your voice be heard here in the United States, your voices, who you are. And I got a lot of people who actually have signed up for it. But what it is that is the next step for me, I'm not sure what that is. So maybe it's the best thing that I can work with you guys to really figure out how to do that. But they wanted to they wanted to have their voices heard, definitely. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Robert, Chris, you have a question. I do. It's a great, a great talk, very inspiring, very interesting from the uh, obviously huge fund of experience that you've acquired over the years. <laughs> you used um, a, a little expression during the talk, uh, which will resonate with the people in this group. Uh, the word the, the expression tipping points, you referred to those. And of course, when in climate change, we tend to think of those, um, if we were writing a children's book, they'd be like the monsters, the dragons out there that are coming to get us. Yeah. But uh, actually, uh, the term is kind of um, uh, emotionally neutral because uh, on the other side, tipping points can equally be very positive. And if we are to uh, address many of the issues or most of the issues that you refer to, um, I suspect, and I'll be interested in your views on this, to what we need are tipping points, social tipping points, so that the ideas oh. that you have been, the ideas that you've been expressing can catch fire and spread really rapidly. So they take hold at sufficient scale and speed to offset the dragons that are waiting there to, 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 to burn it up. And I'm just curious to know what thoughts you might have about how imminent those positive tipping points might be. How close are we to them? Well, I didn't know about the I didn't know about the positive tipping points, and actually, you make me very, very happy tonight. <laughs> I, I can my stomach doesn't feel so bad, but um, the I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, how, are you asking how can we actually get that out there so people? Yeah, can what I'm asking you, Martha. What I'm asking Martha is that in in order to make the things you you talked about, lots of small projects that are coming together. There are people working there. There are things happening. But they're clearly not happening at a scale and speed that is sufficient to combat what is happening at the climate. So they've okay. got yeah. they've, got, they've got to do operate at the same scale and speed, more, faster, bigger, quicker. Yeah, I I I, I agree with you a hundred thousand percent because I'm so goddamn fed up with our landscape architects who just don't do anything. We have to be radical. We have to so be my radical. Question to you how, how would you see that tipping point, that, that positive tipping point? Is it getting any closer? Do you, feel, do you have a, a sort of positive feel that, yeah, actually, we got a good chance of making this happen. This is these, these things are coming together. Or, or do you feel it's still quite distant and quite tenuous, quite a challenge, and we might I, not make it? Oh, I think we're going to, I mean, talk about SAI. I think we're going to make it. I believe we're going to make it, yes. I asked Rafe, Rafe said, well, how long is it going to take before we get it out? He says, now. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, we're going to make, we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do it. And it, I, I bet it's going to be a mess, but I think it's going to happen. I thought since 2016, it's going to happen. You know, that's why I was so interested. Well, this is one thing that is actually, you know, we're going to have to do this. 
And that's why I just said, okay, this is the one, this is great. I have children, we need to do this. But I think that because we have the internet now and we're really connected, I'm really thinking of all sorts of wacky things. I am a wacky thinker, right? I'm all, you know, I always come up with crazy ideas. Well, how about a movie? <laughs> or how about, you know, really getting up on social media? Or, I mean, I really think, I really think that what you guys are doing is fantastic. And the reason is, is that the scientists are really bad at getting out information. And I explained this to them, <laughs> to David Keith and all these guys. I said, look, I'm just a landscape architect. I can say what I think and why I'm thinking it. I don't have to say, well, it's highly likely that blah, 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 or I may not get up tomorrow morning because it has to. I mean, we can actually say our feelings, what we think. And if they don't like it, if they don't like my landscape architecture, so what? I mean, they depend on the truth because that's what scientists do. And they're going to say the things that are very truthful. Like, you don't know whether you're going to get up in the morning because, yeah, we could get an asteroid, but it's going to be highly likely. And that was one of the things that actually wrecked, you know, what was going on in, you know, the 1980s when they almost actually got to climate change was that it was just not, if you had the best person up there talking to those guys, it would have worked, but they didn't. They had the scientists talking. So I, I really get this. So we, as non-scientists, I think are in very good position to do things that could actually be very different. And I've, you know, I've, I've gone to the Landscape Architecture Foundation, American Society of Landscape Architects. So you've got to actually do something to actually get us out there. They said, well, we're just updating your website. I said, nobody's going to see, take a look at your fucking website. Nobody's going to look at that. Who's going to go? We've got to do something other than that, which they don't do, of course. And academia doesn't do it either. So if we are somehow outside of academia and these organizations, I think we have a lot that we can do. And I think that we need to have very kind of creative ideas about what we do. We could have podcasts, we could do all sorts of things. Anyway, that's, I think that there's a lot of possibilities to do these things. I mean, let's, uh, let's see if uh, Robert, I know, is engaged in this space and has a YouTube yeah. channel and is out there doing public speaking. What have, what, what have you got in mind, Robert? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Martha. Uh, I think uh, landscape architecture, as you presented it, is um, it's about a, a change of thinking. It's about uh, a circular economy. It's about uh, systems thinking. Yeah. And and those are all um, changes of uh, of thinking that uh, that feed into the uh, the big questions around around climate change. And mm -hmm. and one of the problems that uh, that we've been discussing in in some of our conversations is that uh, adaptation is not enough because no. like you were you were showing us pictures of New York and uh, uh, flooding and uh, with sea level rise you know there's just the potential for a lot of adaptation efforts to be to be swamped and so this is where I I would hope that uh, the landscape architecture community could could start to think about um, systems thinking at a global level not just a city level and yeah. and say uh, okay well how does uh, how do the the lessons that we're um, finding uh, about the the linear thinking uh, at the city level that's that's failing uh, how does that apply at the global level uh, so that our uh, our thinking about how we adapt to climate change can shift into a, a better understanding of how to mitigate climate change and that especially brings up the problem of albedo and brightening the planet and, um, and cooling the planet as as a primary uh, mitigation strategy well i agree with you um there is um a group called smart surfaces that are really working on that they're also part of our our harvard um grant and working at the increase of albedo in streets and houses. And we're also doing that in our grant. Um, 
Yeah, smart surfaces. I think he's in Washington. Um, well, my question about that is that, number one, there are so many people who are going to be in cities. I mean, the, I, most of the world are going to be dealing with those kinds of environments. And yes, I mean, uh, unless we actually get SAI up there fairly soon, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems. Um, and I think that that is something, I don't know, you know, I mean, that's something that we have to deal with. I mean, we're trying to save the earth, we're trying to save everyone, but that is at a big scale. And then what happens when you're on the ground and you are one of those people? And I think that if we could really uh, be able to address that, that would be, you know, pretty wonderful, you know, to be able to figure out how to organize our cities so that people could live in them. Um, in terms of, I mean, uh, I think that actually the University of Pennsylvania, they actually do work on much bigger areas, let's say, than Harvard does. I mean, Harvard is much more kind of granular while uh, University of Pennsylvania is working on, they actually do a lot of mapping and a lot of looking at how things are going to kind of change. Um, and that might be interesting to take a look at. And in terms of really, uh, I mean, I think that what you're asking is interesting, like how, what kind of systems would we be able to suggest in bigger areas? But in the end, if we don't regenerate our earth, it doesn't matter if we cool it down. You know, that's, I mean, you, you've been hearing about biodiversity, right? And biodiversity is, is really tanking. And actually, I've heard, you know, a scientific paper, or, you know, people saying out of these different, you know, things that are coming in that while climate change is going to continue for quite some time, and taking down the emissions is going to take some time. Uh, I mean, the biodiversity is, I mean, actually, that, I, no, I got it wrong. That, that, we are going to be able to deal with climate change perhaps in a fairly um, not not you know not easy or fast way, but biodiversity is actually a bigger a bigger issue for humanity than climate change, the loss of it. So that's in the long term, but but the, the the problem is that if we don't cool the planet, then we won't be able to regenerate. It. It's it's the converse. Like both both are needed. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I agree. I I think you know regenerating the earth and trying to figure out how we can continue to live because we are you know, organic people. Technology isn't going to help that very much. I mean, technology will be very helpful, but I've given lectures in cities where they actually have a great agenda for all this great technology that's going to happen to them. And I it went in Dubai. It was all about technology. I said, well, if this is what you think is going to help you in climate change, I suggest you buy a nice big piece of land in Canada. You know, <laughs> that's not going to work. But I do think, yeah, I... I would like to hear a little bit more about ideas about what you were saying in terms of kind of a bigger scale that the landscape could work at. I mean, that that would be interesting. I haven't really thought about that. Sure, I mean, I'll, let, let's go on to Mike. Mike McCracken, you're up. Okay, thank you. Well, I have one sort of specific question and then a, a wacky one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the specific question is if you're actually working with the International Support Network for African Development, which uh, I think is based at the University of Nigeria. It's a wonderful, it's an interesting thing. They basically had set up a program where they were trying to get a, a Western science mentor for every graduate student in Africa. Wow. And, thing. and uh, I did one and helped her through to a Masters and then a PhD or something, oh. but but it's an interesting group of professionals and and it might I don't know if they would treat if they sort of collect names of people in 
field like landscape architecture, but providing uh, mentors for people like that would be useful and you start to build up the capability. So if, if you, that's ISNAD Africa, sort of ISNAD Africa, and you can look at the website. The wacky, the, the wacky idea is, I guess I'm wondering why you're not recommending that um, all buildings be underground. Um, you know, why don't we live underground and have have light tubes or solar tubes or whatever they're called coming down or atria or something and, and keep the surface for sort of natural systems and all the various things you're talking about. Uh, keeping a building air conditioned and insulated and everything requires a tremendous amount of energy and effort, uh, especially in moist climates where it requires sort of 20 times the energy or so to, to get the moisture under control and cool cool the temperature a degree as compared to cooling dry air or something. And so why not, why, why aren't cities underground or something like that, which would sort of stabilize their temperature and you could have the surface all to, you know, all for these wonderful recreational things. People could go up there and you have recreation and you have parks, but why are we wasting so much of the of the you know space of cities with buildings instead of just putting them underground, how people live underground? Well, I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I mean, the 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 and and I agree with you. I think that would be a way to go. But uh, I mean, Montreal, reality, Montreal, Montreal does it in the winter. I mean, they basically live underground. I mean, they got tunnels and connects buildings and stores and everything else, and they just live underground. Yeah, and right. yeah, they, yeah. they come yeah. up and experience the weather, but they don't do much else. Up, yeah. up there. But, well, but, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know why we haven't as humanity, but probably because we want to be outside and see the light or this, that, and the other. But I agree with but, you. It was easier to do in the past. I mean, it's cheaper to just build something up above and build a roof or live there. But, but if we're going to really go to eight billion people or something, um, you know, that's that takes up a lot of room in cities. And and why not just go underground or something? Well, I mean, one thing I would. That's a wacky idea. Anyway. Well, I, here's here's one thing, and that with you know eleven billion people, can you imagine how much we we would destroy the the earth? How much it would we would have to really, really screw up the earth to do that because we wouldn't be drilling down, 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 down. I actually think these super tall towers is the way to go, where you have a small footprint and all these people are up. But I think if we were to actually rip up the land, I mean we're losing land around the earth now, and we don't have enough land for agriculture. So I mean, unless you could actually pound it down like a nail. So it's going down vertically. It would be a yeah, lot of land we would be ripping up. <laughs> yeah, it gets hotter down there too. Yeah, let's it gets hotter. To, yeah, let's go to Herb Simmons. Well, I just first wanted to say how how much fun I had listening to you and watching the slides because my my career um, of which I'm now retired uh, was in urban planning and I was head of oh. planning, planning for the state of New Jersey for a decade and this this stuff. I lived and loved every day of my life, and I, it gives me a little bit of pain. I, I've forgotten how much I miss it. What I do now, I don't do because I love. That may sound shocking. I do because it's. I can't think of anything more important to do than this. But so I, I commend you and and. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, the bread. So I just wanted to mention a a few uh, almost like rapid fire four or five okay. real quickly without taking much time uh, resources and and context, most of which you probably know already, but. Uh, when you gave the slide about those sort of mini forests, uh, is that equivalent to the Mayawaki, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, forests? And you've got this project. You, do you work with the folks in Cambridge with Adam Sachs and Biodiversity for a Livable Climate? They're doing a project, or they did one in North Cambridge, as well as other, other places uh, in, the, uh, in the Boston metro area. That's number one. Uh, number two... Um, are you working or are you familiar with Tim Beatley and the Biophilic uh, City uh, Network? Um, you know, they're doing great work with the concept of cities as, uh, as basically as organisms, as living organisms, biophilia. And Tim oh, yeah. is the 
Tim is at the University of Virginia. He's written several books on this. Uh, there's a network of cities and I could see a, a natural collaboration uh, between your work and, and Tim's work. Uh, and I assumed uh, when you refer to Penn, I'm, I'm a Penn graduate from you know, a, a couple centuries ago or whatever, but um, <laughs> I, you probably were referring to the to the McCarg, McCarg Center there, I guess, when you talked about oh, yeah. Yale and Billy Fleming and the folks there. I mean, they do amazing work. You know, they, they, yeah. they're they large scale. They do these basic maps, landscape maps of the whole country and, yeah. and other things like that. And I don't know if you've if you've collaborated with them, but I could see your smaller scale work fitting in so nicely with their larger scale work. Um, I've attended, a, you know, a few of their sessions and follow their work pretty closely. So those are a few quickies. Just one other uh, a quick thing, uh, which is um, I, I'm writing a book now on climate vocabulary, and I I am partial. I am not partial these days to the word adaptation. The reason because adaptation suggests something static. You do something and then you've adapted. Well, unfortunately, in climate there is no static. So, exactly. You know, I, I would use re, re, I use re, readaptation or words like that to suggest uh -huh. that unfortunately our work is never done unless uh, HPAC is successful and we literally uh, reverse climate change and restore a healthy climate. Yeah. Um, and and the last last quick thing is is that there's some new research that um, just came out uh, on the the health benefits of um, of greenery and it it doesn't relate to the you know, the sort of what at least I would have anticipated, which is, you know, you look out on it and you feel calm and relaxed and all that. I mean, there's that, I assume, as well. But it's actually that green surfaces reflect infrared radiation, and they're finding that infrared radiation is critical to human health. Um, and they've actually shown, they've done these sort of, uh, I don't know what kind of camera they use, where if you're, if you're out in an area that's all you know that's all concrete or, or blacktop even if you're at sunrise which is when the maximum uh, infrared light would be you, you don't get any because it doesn't reflect off of any of those surfaces but if you're in a green area and and even if we're wearing clothes you can get this you get all that infrared and it <laughs> revitalizes the mitochondria it enhances melatonin blah 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 so it's something you might want to you know sort of look at i could send you a reference on that uh, as one more dimension of the sort of greening the city and greening the country. And I'll stop there. Well, Herb, are you, where are you in New Jersey? No, I'm in now uh, in the DC, Maryland border area. Oh, okay. Well, geez, thank you very much. I've been trying to write everything down you've said. <laughs> very well, useful. And you're a member of our Google groups. So if you go into the Google groups, um, you can parse out Herb's G Gmail, as you can with anybody else that's uh, been on our group to carry on some of these conversations that we've um, started here. Oh, um, great. So you have a Google group for yeah. your group, right? Yes. And you're in it. So <laughs> there you go. You have access to the members list. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I okay. will be a member. Thank you <laughs> very I much. I can always help you Thank to you. connect with anybody Thank on you. here as well. <laughs> so we're going to go to Ron Bayman. Uh, Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, uh, and thank you, Martha. Uh, uh, I uh, for for a very interesting presentation. I I I wanted to. I have three points I jotted down real quickly here. Yeah. One, um, uh, we, uh, as you may know, uh, HPAC is uh, obviously a, a, a advocate of, of direct climate cooling, uh, yeah. but we're also trying to broaden the conversation. So yes, we do. We do, you know, SAI is one of our methods, but we have 18 others, uh, at least. Oh, I mean, those are the ones in, in our document. So you may want right. to uh, look at that. Um, and some of them, you know, the, as we as we uh, develop SAI, and I, I think it can be done gradually. I mean, there, there are ways to do that in a responsible way. And, and it's high time we started doing that with, with pilot uh, testing and, uh, you know, particularly in the polls and so forth. But uh, uh, you know there are other uh, methods that uh, uh, are, are you know less risky in the sense that they're yeah. they, they, you know lower leverage perhaps you know less less impact and so there there are all kinds of things we can be doing in the meantime and and we it is so important to cool right away that we we are really trying to get people to think about 
you know, cooling in general, and, and in fact, not even just, of course, uh, surface uh, or uh, solar uh, radiation uh, man, uh, modification is or management. <laughs> what the term yeah, of art? Right? Many, many ways but, of saying uh, it is 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 a major major component of that. Or, you know, some of the major methods involve that, but there are also other ways. And uh, yeah. so one of the other ones is in you know some of them involve trying to cool the ocean, so sort of bottom up cooling uh, and harvest some of that energy. So there's there are methods like that, and along those lines, I I thought. You know, we had uh, actually we have a presentation by a fellow named Tom Garo. I don't know if you're familiar with him, no. uh, but he has uh, been working on uh, preventing, uh, particularly small island nations, trying to prevent, you know, further flooding because of sea level rising and storms, increasingly storms. And he's he's he he at least in his presentation. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but he he uses a natural a kind of a natural method in that he was. Uh, uh, stimulating as I, you know, kind of coral reefs and doing that by actually, as I recall, it was, it was kind of electro uh, uh, voltage, uh, uh, you know, putting current in the oceans. He found that by building these coral reefs, he, it was much more effective than building dams and dikes and all the kind of gray methods that you were talking about. So this is something, I mean, and so that's you know you it, it, Tom Garo is you you can you can uh, listen to his presentations HPAC presentation, uh -huh. um, uh, G O G O uh, R E A U, uh, oh, uh, yeah, um, okay. And then um, uh, so for, you know because flooding is obviously going to be a huge serious thing. Yeah. Uh, you know and and of course there's the recent uh, you know work with by uh, Jim Hansen that's even elevating that you know even even much much. To a higher, uh, you know, concern. Uh, but the final point is, um, I'm I'm an economist uh, and a, a radical economist, but 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 um, uh, I'm always, you know, landscape architecture uh, has the kind of image of as kind of a an an, an elite, you know, a wealthy country indulgence, you know, kind of uh, kind of a uh, an architecture in general. I have to say, although you know, people don't don't really fully recognize the importance of it and how, how much it can contribute. But there is also the issue of, you know, a poor country for a poor country, you know, you know, we have so, you know, we, people need air conditioning, people need food, people, you know, why, why should we start talking about, you know, these, uh, you know, beautifying our, you know, well, people would call it beautifying our cities or, uh, so I'm wondering, um, and, and so I'm wondering what kind of, um, if if you the, the the field has explored methods of of making this economically beneficial, I mean beneficial for 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 uh, you know uh, for to, to help with poverty and people that don't you know, cannot satisfy their basic needs. So when you're you know for example, can the trees uh, be fruit trees? Can they grow food? Can, you know urban gardens? Uh, can you have uh, you know kind of Places where people can uh, sh shelter from from excessive heat and so forth, as you're, you know, within the kind of landscape environment. So I'm just kind of curious about the sort of connection, particularly for for developing countries, because I think that would, you know, it seems to me that would make it a much more uh, something that they would be, uh, you know, find more appealing and attractive. Yeah. For, you know. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. No, well, I. Th I yeah, thank you. I mean, there are a lot of bits and pieces that were really interesting. Um, I mean, getting back to what people think about landscape architecture is completely understandable. And it is kind of this elite thing and making these beautiful French gardens and all this kind of stuff. But, and I think I'm probably a little bit kind of at the forefront of stuff because I was always doing these strange things at Harvard and we tell being told that I'm irrelevant. <laughs> I actually taught geoengineering. I, I, it was a geoengineering kit for designers. And, you know, it was really great. They, they, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're wasting our, our precious time doing this stuff. And I'm like, well, actually, it's not really that irrelevant. But I think that, um, let me, I'll just speak about what we're doing in our con con company. And we have, we have, uh, offices in New York, London, and uh, Shanghai. So we work in a lot of places, but 
now, I mean, yes, they need to be beautiful because we need beauty as humans. That's, I mean, it's just, nobody likes to talk about it, but it's very, very impactful in terms of how we feel about ourselves, blah, 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 blah. But it's gotta be performative. We have to actually, well, in order to be performative, we have to know what's going on. We have to understand what's happening in the future. We have to know what's happening in climate change. We have to know what the soils are like. We have to really know because, you know, uh, we just kind of had this conversation with one of this kind of new client. It's a big project. I said, well, have you, you know, have you thought about the future? Are you going to just flip this building, build it, flip it, and you're gone? Or is this going to be something that you're going to care for? And it's an investment. If this is an investment, you need to be thinking about what's going to be happening in the future. Have you thought about that? And it's always no. They, they don't know what's happening. And I, I go through it. I said, well, you know, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> and this is what you're going to have to start looking at. And we're not going to actually even starting start to design until we understand what we need to do under the ground, what, you know, what the water is, where's the water going, you know, what angle are you taking, blah, blah, blah. We start from not just the ground up, it's from underneath the ground up. And we really take a look at what needs to be dealt with. And then after that, then you can really figure out what the design is going to be or what it's going to look like. But it's always based on something that we're dealing with to actually make sure that their investment is going to hold up over time. And they're always so grateful. Like, oh, that's really great. You must, you know, so, well, you, know you, you really need to think about that. If you're going to do this big project. So I, I, I mean, right now, landscape architecture is going in that direction. I really, I was able to actually sound the call a number of years ago saying, hey, it's, it's climate change stupid. You know, we got to do this. So we're starting to get there. And I think that there's going to be a lot. I actually believe that it will be the go-to profession eventually in climate change because we work with natural systems and we work kind of collectively. You know, we're, we're kind of generalists. We need to work with a lot of types of people. I wish I could have been working or I wish I could work with planners. But planners would never say, oh, let's call up a landscape architect. I mean, never. But that's where this information is going to be coming from. It's not going to be coming from the architects. By the way, um, there's, uh, I, I am the head of a, the jury for the, L, it's called the <clears throat> Obel Award in Architecture. And last year we, got a, we gave an award to a company in Europe who is now making concrete that takes down carbon dioxide and mineralizes it. They got a big award. So things are happening there. But you know, in one sense, architecture is a problem. Landscape architecture is a solution. You know, we're going to have to do something about cities to actually make cities work. So I think that it really could be a very important part of our collaboration. Because as we know, climate change is so complicated and cities are complicated, people are complicated. Um, we can't just sit down by ourselves. You know, we need to be actually putting ourselves and our thinking, our knowledge together, so we collectively can come up with the best ideas. We have time for one last comment, and Jonathan Cole has been waiting patiently. So, Jonathan, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, that was a great presentation. And uh, thank you. sure, the uh, so I do uh, designs for residential reflective devices. And if you if you go to my avatar picture and find the three little dots, you can pin pin that picture to your screen and that'll make it bigger. Oh, wait a uh, Kind of like a cheap oh. way to share the screen. No, wait, so what do I do? What, what, what? You, you look at my picture, which is- I can't find your Got the it. hand up and then it's you go to the your, three- It's on your screen. You go to the three dots that are near my picture. I don't see you. I'm a, he's, um, I have a, he's a solar, yeah, he has a hand up and he's got a solar platform. I've just put a on a mirror. Donna, it's it's mirror. Mirror. <laughs> I don't see a hand. It's Robert, Martha, Sudan. Oh, wait a minute, maybe. Yeah, I just scroll. I'm very helpless. 
<laughs> well, well, don't 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 do a screen share. I could do a screen share, but don't do a screen share. That'll cut down the size of it. I can't do anything right now. I'm. There you go. Now, uh, well, do you see everybody? Do you see a grid view, a gallery view? I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. Okay, so one of them has their hand up, right? Me? No, I don't. I know nobody has their hand up. Leslie, well, has their hand up. Uh, we have 15 participants, so you need to take the arrow and go to the next page. You should have two pages. Oh, shoot, where's my, let's see, next page. There are 15 Just, invite copy link. How do I do this? I, so where uh, your pictures are across your yeah. screen at the last, to the right of the last one should be an arrow a pointing carrot that you can click on. I'll take you to the next page. Yeah, well, um, I didn't really tell you about myself and my relationship to technology, but there's no, <laughs> there's no. Okay. There's, I think we're learning. No, yeah, it's Perhaps, awful, sorry. Um, We'll put your um, email into the chat and Jonathan can- oh, wait, No, I got full screen, but now it's just everybody's the same. That's okay, as long as I'm there. Do you see me with the hand raised, Jonathan Cole? No, I don't. Is somebody who's not a person, <laughs> a picture? Well, it's, a, it's a picture, but I occupy the same amount of a square. I well, thought I it was you, but show uh, non video partners exit full doesn't really screen. matter it's it's just you got a a, a um aluminium foil uh mirror on top of a roof but <laughs> why don't you, yeah, why don't you just talk about it anyway yeah let's sure, go because sure. we're at the end of our meeting here so sure. it's uh i'm really sorry jonathan. it's okay it's okay I, I think jonathan had a right. point no, to no make problem. so jonathan well, there's, why another, there's another there's another way to do this i'll just do a share screen <laughs> um here we go I'll just, I'll Jonathan just. Cole. Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen. Now you can see it. Oh yeah, I can see that. Oh, okay, all right. So anyway, we uh, we make devices like this. This this is about $50, $50 worth of material. And it's, most of our simpler devices are not patentable. So we don't mind sharing them on the internet as we develop them. And this is a two square meter reflector. And over the course of five years, it would offset one ton of CO2 equivalent. And this would be something where you'd send in a hundred dollars and it would show up as a kit and then you'd put it together and then you'd put it on your roof. And it's been tested in as high as 50 mile an hour winds so far. And there's no connection to the roof. So it, it yeah. doesn't require a permit. Uh, it has a rebar, steel rebar inside those white tubes. That's what gives it some weight, makes it cling to the surface. But anyway, this is the kind of thing we design and it increases the albedo of the house, obviously, the reflectivity. Yeah. yeah. And I really enjoyed a one particular slide of yours where you showed the dollar value that you were saving. And you had a $50 million line item for white roofs. Do you recall that slide? Yeah. So that was really nice because um, the, the first order effect of, of heating on a city is based on the city's albedo, which is its whiteness. Yep. So if you took two equivalent cities, same number of buildings, same number of days of sunlight, the city that was whiter would hold on to less heat overnight for that yeah. heat island effect. Yeah. The addition of dark green vegetation on the average city actually increases the, yeah. the darkness of it. Yep. Yeah. So when you're adding a landscaping of trees and grasses, you have to offset that with white roofs or some other uh, lightening of a surface so that your overall albedo of the city doesn't actually get darker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. what you took into account in that slide. I thought that was genius that you had, hey, we're gonna do all this stuff with trees and then we're gonna do this stuff with the white roofs. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we, we painted whatever roof we could find to paint. I mean, again, this is a group of students, but we were working with smart surfaces because we're looking at the whole city of Springfield, Massachusetts. And there will be, you know, a, we're gonna have metrics and everything after it. So 
Although right. what's interesting with the talking to the mayor of that city that we chose, he was ecstatic, not so much about the trees and cooling the city, but that it was his stormwater management problem. He didn't have enough money and you know he, he was so happy that we could deal with stormwater in a different way that actually kind of, it's like a twofer. You can actually take down, you know, carbon dioxide, you can cool the city, but you can also absorb a lot of water because the idea is that this trench goes all the way through the whole city, all on, on all streets. So that would be a forest that would be big enough to be able to have impacts on, you know, on the, on, on the city in terms of cooling it down. So Right, exactly. So I just wanted to point out that the the first round of money might to cool the city might be best spent on uh, lightening its albedo, either white roofs or uh, even better with reflective foils, which um, have a even greater effect than white roofs. Um, yes. White roofs or white surfaces such as walls and things or sidewalks, they spread out the uh, radiation that they're reflecting in pretty much a cone. That, that goes in every direction, but you know a lot of it goes upward as well, out to the sky and out to space. But but with a with a specular surface or or a mirror like surface, you get a, a, a beautiful exit of the of all the heat. Interesting. Right out. Well, I've just snipped your your uh, green uh, grabbed it. Okay, there. no problem. <laughs> Feel free. Just, That's just not a patentable cause... device. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is really great, and yeah, it's a uh, so. I mean, do you <laughs> so, do you have a do you have a company, Jonathan? Well, we do. We're still in the uh, quiet phase uh, because of, of once we come out online with all of our designs, they're going to be immediately grabbed uh, from worldwide manufacturers and and manufactured outside of our ability to. Uh huh to uh, protect oh. them so we're only releasing the ones that are totally unpatentable this device is way too simple to be patentable it's not novel enough yeah i was wondering why it wouldn't be past unpatentable but you know you could just really do a tiny little difference and then it would be gone yeah well it's a great idea i really like them i think that they're really fantastic yeah and it's a learning opportunity too the family gets something like this or some of our larger ones that go in the backyard and make little uh, little playhouses and stuff, uh, and it becomes a teachable moment for for the kids and for the neighbors talking to them about reflectivity and albedo and cooling. So it's it's almost it's almost main thrust is is educational rather than uh, than functional in terms of uh, cooling the planet, since we would need on the order of uh, a trillion of these devices to cool the planet by half a degree Celsius. <laughs> Well, I think Yatel has a plan for um, doing something like that, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the other thing is that it's certainly, um, since it's not hooked up to anything, it's certainly something that can be used in, in a more rural uh, kind of setting and um, less costly in terms of infrastructure. So, I mean, it looks, um, looks very interesting, and I like to teach a teachable moment aspects of it. We've reached the end of our time and I want on behalf of all of us to um, say thank you to Martha uh, for your input. And um, we, have a, uh, we have a chat and a recording of, of this that will be recirculated to the group and the recording will be posted on our website. Um, so thank you so much. And um, again, any of you who wish to um, be included. I don't see any really new people here, so I think you're all on our on our Google groups. We look forward to seeing you. And Robert, you have an announcement about our next meeting. Well, we haven't confirmed it as yet, but uh, okay. we've been in we've been in discussion with uh, Dr. David Keith at uh, Harvard uh, to um, lead a Q and A session. Uh, hopefully, on our uh, next uh, session on, on the uh, 9th of March, I think it is. Um, anyway, Thursday in two weeks. Um, so uh, David is appreciate very busy and uh, hasn't been able to confirm the date, but he's eager to uh, join with us, but we'll just uh, need to confirm the time and, and uh, I look That's forward great. to being able to do that soon. 
Super. So Fantastic. notice will be um, watch your mailboxes and notices of our next meeting. And thank you all for attending today. If the steering circle would stay online, um, everybody else have a great day. And thank, thank you for inviting you. me. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed meeting you all. I'll see you again, okay?